Hey guys, what does this Black Widow Luger, brought home by a U.S. vet, have to do with dyslexia? Stay tuned. Okay, first let's start off with the Black Widow Luger. A little bit of background information. I, I did a video before, you can check it out. I have to point to it. Uh, you can check out the video I did before. I go into a lot more detail of where the name Black Widow came from. Um, I know the man that started the whole idea, and a lot of you confirm that, um, Ralph Shattuck. It's basically a United States marketing uh, tool that people use to sell um, BYF-41 and BYF-42 Lugers. You can tell these pretty easily by just looking at the top. You see the BYF-41, uh, uh, BYF being the Mauser code. So they were made in the Mauser factory in 1941. And then BYF-42. These guns in particular, about half of them came with wooden grips and half of them came with Black uh, Widow. <laughs> there I go, using the term. Uh, black plastic grips with black plastic bottoms. Now this one is transitional. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but they generally come with black plastic bottoms and black plastic grips. Now recently, as, as a matter of fact, yesterday, one of our viewers wrote to me and said, what the heck is going on with the Black Widow prices? That's just the way he said it too. Black Widow prices have gone through the roof. And, uh, you know, he was wondering, has there been a movie that came out? Maybe James Bond is now carrying a Black Widow Luger. Not true. Maybe Brad Pitt did a movie. No, I, as far as I know, nothing happened to accelerate these prices. But I will tell you, I've been collecting them for 25, 30 years. And I was paying about 2,500 for a really nice Black Widow, maybe five, six, seven years ago. Uh, lately, they started to creep up and I was paying 3,500 for a really nice Black Widow. For a full rig, I'm probably paying about 4,500. Uh, then I was going to auctions and I couldn't, I couldn't win them because they were going for 6,000 and I thought, I'm not paying those prices. So I just stopped, you know, I stopped buying them thinking that's crazy. But the prices stayed steady. In fact, they uh, were, were climbing uh, more and more. So when people would send them to me, I would say, I'm not going to pay that much. I'm not going to pay $4,500 for a Black Widow. Uh, first of all, they're, they're pretty plentiful. In 41, they made about 100000 for the Army. Not all of them had black plastic. Some of them were the brown uh, grips. And by the way, the brown grip, BYF 41 and 42, you can still find them for $2,500. So it's just the difference of putting a black, a set of Black Widow grips on them, black plastic grips on them, and you, in some cases, double your money. So there's a lot of reasons for collectors to find the grips, uh, swap them out, and sell them as a Black Widow, as opposed to a brown recluse. Now that's also a term. Actually, uh, my friend Scott uh, came up with that one. Uh, with the brown wood, we call it a brown recluse as opposed to a black widow. And believe me, that's a joke. Don't write and say you can't just make up names. It's a joke. But switching out the grips can make people money. And so, as I said, I was refusing to buy them. So people would send them to me on consignment and say, could you list these for 45, 55, 65, and I was too embarrassed to do it. I said, I don't want them on my site. If you go there now, I do have them on, I have one on right now at 4,500. But I was embarrassed at first, so I said, I, I won't do that, but I'll put them on Gunbroker, which is an auction. We put them on Gunbroker for a dollar, and we had prices, uh, we sold Black Widow rigs from uh, 6,500 up to 8,500. Uh, well, of course, what happens after people see that, then they send me more and just trade secret. Last week, I probably got in about 12 Black Widow uh, Lugers or rigs uh, with people saying, hey, get me, get me that much money for the gun that I only paid $2,500 for. So the bottom line is there is a feeding frenzy going on right now. Uh, and the prices just keep going up and up. Now, if you've lived as long as I have, you've seen these bubbles before in collectibles, but also houses. I can remember when beach houses, they just kept going up and up and up and people would pay whatever they had to pay. And then in 2008, it all crashed. Now in the collector market, I don't think these prices are gonna crash, but I do think they're gonna settle back because everybody's going through their safe, pulling out their Black Widow, rigs, uh, Black Widow Lugers, 
and, and selling them. And so there, there seems, there's going to be an uptick in the number that are available. And I do think prices will settle, settle back quite a bit. That happened with Krigoffs. Uh, Krigoff prices went above 10,000. Then they came all the way back to five or 6,000, and now the prices are, uh, have steadied and they're starting to move up again. And so now I, I'm, I'm getting for a nice Kragoff Luger with a matching mag, I'm now getting 75, and they used to be over 10,000. So things will settle back on the Black Widow Luger. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background and why, uh, no good reason, why the prices are so high. But I'm also a businessman, and so if I can put them on Gunbroker and get 75 or 85 for a really nice rig, uh, why wouldn't I? Uh, now this is a really nice rig, so let's talk about this gun in particular. Uh, this is the rig, and this is just a really beautiful example. We'll start with the holster. You can see it's a black holster. After 1940, they pretty much uh, had an edict that the holster should be black. This one originally, uh, well, I don't know when it was dyed, but probably straight from the factory. You can see it has a brown interior. Um, by the way, this should have a tool that's marked 655. And it does. I don't know how well Randy will get that photograph, but generally the tool will be proof marked the same as the gun. And you can see it's a 655 uh, proof mark. That's the uh, military inspector proof. And the tool is also 65, Eagle 655. So it has the proper tool. In 1942, by the way, uh, they, most of them will be Eagle 135 and not all of the tools, but some of the tools will be 135. In other words, they were still using up uh, the, the year before the 655 tool. They were still using them up in 42, uh, but toward the end of 42, they went to 135. And those tools are pretty rare. The tool itself can sell for, uh, this, this might go for 150. The 135 tool uh, could go for 350. Um, now, these are the, the grips, which is black plastic. Uh, you see the original finish is beautiful. Uh, I'd, I'd rate this 97%. There's a little bit of wear there, which is pretty common. And a little bit of wear here, which is pretty common. You see the roll mark where the, where the toggle comes back. Uh, but generally, this is just about as good as they come, unless they've been refinished. And so this is all original finish. Now, it does come with a matching magazine. There you see the uh, serial number of the gun. And here's the serial number of the gun, also in, on the front of the frame. And um, this, uh, it's hard to read the script, but this is in the P block. And if we go to uh, my book that just came out on Third Reich Lugers, this says not for resale. That's because it was an uh, author copy for me to proof. And um, so this one can't be sold, but this is my copy. And if I go to, um, there's a chart about the, all the Lugers, and we go to the date. Uh, it is army proofed, and you can see the serial range. So it started in the O block. This is P, so this is a pretty early one. In 1940, they were numbering uh, all the bottom of the uh, aluminum bottom magazines, and then of course when they went to black plastic, here's the spare mag, by the way. So this one has one matching mag, and this is the black plastic. They did try to number those, but it, it ended up chipping, uh, chipping the bottom, and so they stopped trying. Uh, you'll see KUs with numbered. At the Mauser factory, they tried numbering them, but the conclusion was it, it would chip or weaken it enough that it didn't, didn't stay together. So it was only the aluminum bottom ones that they, they numbered. So this is in the beginning of the run. Again, here you see, uh, here's 41 Army. You can see the, the range. So it went from O all the way to Z and then there would be a no, no suffix, and then A and B. And that was about uh, 94, 95,000 of them. And you can see uh, the value, 2,500, but there's an asterisk that says that if it's Black Widow, uh, you can add $1,000 plus a matching magazine, you add 30% 30, 30 more. Um, and I will update these as the prices change, but then you also see Craig's Marine and the Luftwaffe had a contract. So altogether, there's about 120,000 BYF, uh, BYF 41s. Now, I, I believe, and what I read in the reference books, that the early ones were mostly brown, uh, brown wooden grips. 
And so I'd say probably 90% were brown wooden and only about 10% plastic. Halfway through the run, they were probably 50-50, and by the end of the run, they were probably mostly black plastic. Um, now, some of you are probably thinking, how do we know that these were not swapped? The answer is, I don't. I have no way of knowing that these were swapped. Uh, they fit perfectly, and the repros typically do not fit very well. You'll see gaps in here. Um, certainly in the bottom, they don't fit quite right on the repro. Uh, the other way that I tr uh, try to tell if they're a repro, these are Bakelite. The original ones were Bakelite, and they, when they try to replicate them, it's a, it's a later plastic, and it's, it's a little bit duller. And when you tap them together, that's what they sound like. But these will sound like a castanet, a little bit higher pitch. It's a really hard plastic, and they actually break uh, pretty easily. They crack pretty easily. So this, this gun just came in today. This is actually a uh, Sour 38H. These are also made of Bakelite, and you can see how easily they break. Um, but it's the same material. The, um, the Walther PPK and PP, they were all made with this very hard plastic, but um, sours in particular, they break very easily. It's, oh, it's, it's hardly ever that I find sour 38H grips that are not cracked, uh, and this is a good example. So as uh, previously mentioned, this is a hard plastic and it does have a high pitch. These will be uh, slightly softer plastic. You can hear the difference. Now at a gun show, you may not be able to do that. I can also see the difference. Uh, these are actually good quality, um, but again, they're not gonna fit exactly right. The, the fit is always off. Okay, case in point, you know, we spare no expense for you guys. So I pop that off and I'm gonna pop this on. It does look pretty good, doesn't it? But see that? Doesn't fit. And then this is the original again. Um, it's a tight fit, so you have to make sure it's snug at the top and then you push in and you can't get a, a dime uh, slipped in there as opposed to this and I push down and you see that it's not quite right. It doesn't, it doesn't line up. Same way with the back, there's a gap in there. I'll push that together, there's still a gap and in the front there's still a gap. Okay, now that I've shown you some trade secrets, let me sadly predict that, um, you know, the difference in price between a brown recluse and a black widow used to be 200 to $400. And so the motivation was not as keen to uh, make the reproduction. So the quality of the reproductions are easy to spot, but my prediction is when there's a thousand dollars difference that somebody is gonna figure out how to reproduce these. And um, when that happens, we'll try to report it to you and, and find a way to find out. But uh, it also, once that happens, it will drive down the prices. But these are absolutely beautiful guns and this one has a matching mag. Now let's talk about uh, the person who brought this home uh, because uh, some holsters have, you know, they have the name of the GI inside or they, I've seen huge carve their names in it. Uh, but this one very faintly put their name in it and it does say E.L. Piper. And then this is supposed to be Junior, although notice the J is backwards. We'll talk about that. Here's his GI number. And then up here we see it again. Interestingly, we see Germany, June, with a backwards J, 1945. Now this is maker mark dated, Waffen stamped, and P08. So for me, the reason I really wanted to show you this, less so about talking about the uh, aspects of the Black Widow, but that's very timely. But I mostly want to talk about the vet that brought this back. And really uh, dig into learning about him a little bit. I did find a little bit of information, and so we're gonna talk about that. This is uh, Edwin Lloyd Piper, Jr. Uh, this is a picture of him, uh, certainly as an older man, and we know that he was born in 1921. So by the time he entered the war, I assume around 1941, he enlisted in, in late 41, I think early 42. Uh, he went into the U.S. Army, 
uh, and he uh, went in as a private but achieved the rank of uh, sergeant. He uh, stayed in for quite a bit uh, because he was also in the Korean War after the World War II was over. And I'm going to read a little bit about Edwin. Uh, I'm going to call him Ed because I assume that's what his friends called him. Uh, it just says that Mr. Piper was born in December of 1921. His wife was Nelda and preceded him in death in 1993. Ed, uh, by the way, died in 2012 at the age of 90. Mr. Piper proudly served his country in the U.S. Army. Edwin fought bravely in World War II and the Korean War, escaping captivity in both. While in the Army, Mr. Piper received many awards, including two Purple Hearts, the Korean Service Medal. This is not in order that he received them, uh, but this is the order in which they recorded them in his obituary. Uh, the Korean Service Medal, a Silver Star, the Distinguished Unit Citation, Combat Infantry Badge, the Republic of Korea Presidential Unit Citation, four overseas bars, the European African uh, Middle Eastern Ribbon, and four Bronze Stars, the Good Conduct Medal, World War II Victory Medal, and a Marksmanship Medal, and a Rifle Bar. Uh, during the Korean War, Mr. Piper escaped from North Korea prisoner of war camp. This guy was the real deal. Um, a brave soldier served his country. He actually worked as a mechanic in, right outside of Chicago. It seems like he uh, lived in the Chicago area and he was a lo locomotive engineer and uh, mechanically inclined. He enjoyed the outdoors, hunting, fishing, and especially his cabin on the Iroquois River. Uh, some of the comments uh, that I got a kick out of was uh, he had a cabin uh, next to the river and would take his boat out. He had a lot of friends. They commented on the obituary page that they used to always go to his cabin and fish. And he had an outhouse uh, down by the water. I guess the outhouse isn't supposed to be down by the water, but he had an outhouse. And he said he had a mannequin of a woman in the outhouse. So when he would encourage his guys to go there to take a leak, uh, they would walk in on a woman. And he got a good kick out of that. So I know he had a great sense of humor, uh, but he's also a brave man. Now, the other thing that I wanted to notice, and my background as a psychologist, some of you know, I have a PhD in uh, psychology and I worked in a clinic, but I also worked as a school psychologist diagnosing learning disabilities. Uh, some of you picked it up right away. Um, when he was, uh, when he took this as a souvenir, 1945, he was in his mid twenties, and he was still using uh, a, a backward J. Uh, I saw that obviously in diagnosing diagnosing le learning disabilities. Of course, they called it dyslexia at one point, and then learning disabilities, and now learning differences. But a lot of you can relate. You grew up in, in an era where there wasn't special education. And I know firsthand the, the pain and suffering that comes when you struggle in school. I can remember telling parents that their child had a learning disability and the mom would cry and say, what's gonna become of our son or our daughter? And I'd say, you know what? They can be anything they want because um, just because you don't have good reading and math skills. So for example, left brain would be reading, writing, and arithmetic. They do poorly in school, but right brain, they excel at music, art, uh, mechanical things, uh, spatial relations, architecture, uh, creativity, entrepreneurship, all of those things are, are things that uh, he probably exceeded at. Of course, he was a uh, locomotive engineer and he also loved to hunt and fish. It seemed uh, like he had a beautiful life after serving his country for at least 10 years. So for that, thank you, Edwin, for your service to our country.